And if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Our text this morning will be Mark 12, verses 35 through 40. Let us hear the word of God. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard it gladly. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Sends the reading of the word of God. Let's bring us up to speed where we're at here in Mark's gospel. This is what I would call Long Tuesday. This is a very long Tuesday in Mark's recording here. It is the last Tuesday before the crucifixion. Jesus has just faced a barrage of questions. They're seeking to discredit Jesus, the religious establishment, maybe we would call them that. They're seeking to discredit Jesus because what they want to do is turn the tide of popular opinion away from Jesus. Right now, he's the man of the crowds. They love him. It's interesting, though, where they go from Tuesday to late Thursday into Friday. Nonetheless, at this moment, Jesus is, uh, he would get the populist vote among the people, but he is hated by the religious people. He has successfully answered every question that they threw at him, ranging from politics and religion to resurrection and the life to come. By what authority do you speak these things? What is the greatest commandment? They threw everything they had at him. But even as I prayed, we know that Jesus is the word of God. And so he successfully answers every question that they threw at him. And I would call your attention to verse 34 of this passage. This is where they are left off. When when they saw that Jesus had answered wisely, because he is the wisest of them all, he he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And this is the point here. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. They're done. They have given up. They have screamed, uncle, it's over. There's a saying that the best offense is a good defense. Jesus, through this passage here, since chapter 11, verse roughly 27, has demonstrated perfect defense. And now, before us, he moves. He moves to the offense. Now we see Jesus becomes the one that starts to ask the questions. That's what we have before us here in this passage. Before us specifically, Jesus asked questions, and what he's done here is he's exposing the beliefs and the behaviors of religious people. Friends, beloved, this is a warning passage that we are entering into. It is a warning passage concerning the beliefs and behaviors of those that are viewed as authorities concerning matters of faith and practice. They are called the scribes. And I have titled this morning's message, Beware of Pastors and Preachers. And I want you to see here the connection that is to be made here. The scribes to the first century Judaism are principally what pastors and preachers are to 21st century Christianity. There can be a parallel in the way that they are viewed. So I want us to see here and enter into this text together. Look with me at verse 35. If you like headings, I've supplied you with two. We will notice first that we will see that Jesus goes and we see dangerous beliefs exposed in verses 35 through 37, and then we will see dangerous behaviors exposed exposed in verses 38 through 40. Let us consider these dangerous beliefs exposed. Verse 35. 
And we read, as Jesus taught in the temple. Now, this whole passage here consists of Jesus' teaching. He is in the temple, and Mark records it very briefly. Matthew will draw this out in his gospel in chapter 23 of these seven long woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. Mark summarizes it really, really quick in three verses. And what we have here is Jesus' teaching. I want you to observe the stamina that Jesus has. He's been attacked. He's had, he's had all these questions come at him. He's playing defense against them, and he's answering them all well. And now, after this long Tuesday morning, maybe into the afternoon at this point, after a series of ta- attacks, Jesus begins to teach. And we notice here he goes after the scribes. Jesus taught in the temple, and he asks the question, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? We'll get to the question, but first we need to understand, who are the scribes? Who are these men? Well, simply put, they are teachers of the Mosaic law. They fulfill a role within first century Judaism that was originally given to the priests and the Levites during the time of Moses. Ezra is considered the first scribe and the return from exile from Babylon. Ezra's a good scribe. Ezra establishes the school of the scribes, and through inspiration, they are the ones who really organized and gave us and formed, put the, New Te- or the Old Testament in the final form that we see it and have it today. As the scrolls were recovered uh, post-exile, remember what happens with Ezra as he, they discover the book of the law, and Ezra stands up and he reads it before the people, and they, would not, they couldn't stop. They hadn't heard it for years. But what was established in the 6th century B.C., what was formed over time, became deformed. So by the time you get around to the 1st century A.D. and 1st century B.C., many, not all, but many of the scribes had become inwardly wicked men, greedy men, men of position and power. You know the old maximum absolute power corrupts absolutely. The title scribe would denote one that was a learned teacher of the law. They held positions of respect, of authority, of honor in Jewish society. Now, when we hear the term scribe, we might think of somebody who who transcribes a document. That's probably the way we would understand it today. And while that is true, because most of them had the job of transcribing and making copies of the scrolls, that's not all that they would do. They were much more than just transcribers. These are well-educated men. And what they did primarily was that they spoke for and interpreted the Word of God. In our cultural context the way that they viewed scribes in the first century is a way in which we would view pastors or preachers today. And so Jesus is sitting down here. Here's the scene. He's sitting down, as the rabbi would do, in the temple, and he begins to, he begins to teach. And what he does is he exposes a dangerous doctrine. Notice with me again in this text the question that Jesus asks. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David. You might hear that question, you say, yeah, Jesus, what's up with that? Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We would need to pause here. Isn't this what brother Bartimaeus referred to Jesus back in chapter 10, verse 47? He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me? And Jesus doesn't say, why does Bartimaeus call me son of David? Jesus doesn't rebuke him and say, hey, you got this wrong. What's going on here? What's happening in this passage? Actually, Bartimaeus is praised for calling Jesus the son of David. Another question that we might ask, isn't the anointed one, the Messiah, the prophesied of long ago in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, wouldn't we read that he's the son of David? Isaiah 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, Jesse the father of David, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, 
the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now, Isaiah 11 is not talking about just the first son of Jesse, David. Isaiah 11 is pointing forward to the Messiah. This is describing the Christ. But he will be a shoot from the stump of Jesse. With right, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. He shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. What is Jesus doing here? What is the issue that is being brought up when he asks this questions? How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David when the scriptures tell us that the Christ is the son of David? Here's the point I want you to see. It's not that the scribes taught an untruth, but rather a half-truth. This is a dangerous doctrine because half-truths are whole lies. They only taught the humanity of the Messiah. They only looked forward as Jesus, the son of David. What's in their mind? We need a political, social reform. We need the one who's going to sit on David's throne, who is going to overthrow Rome, who is going to liberate national Israel. This is the one to whom we will look. They wanted a political and national liberator. Friends, they were not wrong in looking for the son of David. They were incomplete. But here's their problem. They refused to recognize it. And they refused to recognize the one who stood before them. They hated the Messiah that they didn't want. Jesus. 48 hours ago from this event... Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. He's on a donkey. All the prophecies of Zechariah are just coming before. Jesus is saying that I am the Messiah without saying I am the Messiah. He's demonstrating it. Hosanna to he who comes in the name of the Lord, to the son of David. They heard all of this. And it made them angry. Instead of humbly submitting to themselves to the Messiah that stood before them, they wanted to kill him. They knew that Jesus embraced the title, and they hated him for it. Again, I would argue that he is the Messiah that they never wanted. And here's the sobering reality of their half-truth doctrine. Is that dangerous doctrines and half-truths are the pathway that is paved to hell. Brothers and sisters, understand this. If we are wrong concerning the identity of who the Christ is, it does not matter what you are right about, about anything in this life. If you do not get this one right, nothing else matters. Similarly, when he asked, Jesus asks the question to Peter, who do people say that I am? It is the most important question you will ever ask and answer in your life. You must understand and get the identity of Christ correct. So in asking this question, though, I want us to understand, Jesus isn't saying that the Christ is not the son of David. He is saying that he is much more than just the son of David. This is awesome what he's about to do here. Verse 36 had me giddy all week. And I just could not wait for this moment. This is fantastic what Jesus does here in this one jam-packed, loaded verse. Jesus argues that the Christ is much more than the son of David. And he says it because David said it. Look at verse 36. David himself. Jesus says, David said it. But notice, not just David. Look at your scriptures. David himself in the Holy Spirit. But not just David himself in the Holy Spirit. David himself in the Holy Spirit declared this. He didn't suggest this. He didn't say this might be a possibility. He authoritatively declared that this is the reality in the Holy Spirit. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
I want to stop here and show you two major points of theological significance from this very passage. And the first is divine inspiration. Jesus affirms the divine inspiration of Scripture. Divine inspiration is not a doctrine that the church developed 300 years after the Christ event. The church did not form or come up with inspiration, just as the church did not come up and form and, and decide what is the authoritative books of Scripture. The church recognized what has already been. Jesus affirms the divine inspiration of the Word of God. And notice how he does it. First, David. Here is the human author. Second, in the Holy Spirit, divine author. So if you were ever asked a question, who wrote the Bible? Did, did, or who wrote the Psalms? Or maybe, maybe even one, or who wrote uh, the Gospel of Mark? Was it Mark or was it God? The answer is yes. Yes. Who wrote Psalm 110? Was it David or was it God? Yes. There is one divine author through all of the 66 books of Scripture. This is why they all coherently come together. How else do you take, you know, 40 different authors over 1,500 years, most of which who've never met each other, couldn't collaborate together and come up with one unified story? The king slays the dragon and saves the bride, right? So you have divine inspiration in the Holy Spirit, divine author. And then that final word, he declared. This is the authoritative declaration. So when we would even put the, the preface to verse 36 together, this is what Jesus is saying, is that the Holy Spirit inspires the authoritative word of God through the human author. It's not dictation. Theologically, we call this verbal plenary inspiration. So first, Jesus establishes the inspiration of Scripture rooted in divine authority. God who never lies, therefore the Scriptures can be trusted. And then based off of this, he establishes here his second theological point, the divinity of the Messiah. Notice with me what he says here. From divine inspiration now to the divinity of the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord. We got to pause. 95% of your Bible translation is great. But every now and then, and this isn't a wrong translation. This is, this is right. There are things that just get lost in translation. And this is a passage that is lost in translation. English cannot do this justice. You could even flip back to Psalm 110, verse 1, and you would notice that you would, in, your, uh, in the Psalms, the word LORD would be in all caps. But it still says, the Lord said to my Lord. What's actually being stated here in this line? I don't want us to lose sight of this because it's really the main point here this morning. Let me translate it to you what it said originally. Basically, it says this, Yahweh spake an oracle to my Adonai. Yahweh spake an oracle, or Yahweh spoke to, or gave oracle to my Adonai. That's what it originally says here. So what's being established in this single verse, David is talking about two people who are superior to himself. Yahweh, need no explanation. The covenant faithful God. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And this term, to my Adonai. Well, actually, in original language, that's just one word. And to my Adonai means, and what it was understood as, a messianic title. It was a term that referred to the Messiah. So maybe another way that we could phrase this as what David is saying here in this line is David is saying, God said to my superior master, David, again, recognizes two persons of greater significance than himself. This is important to why Jesus asks that follow-up question in verse 37. So let's establish that. Yahweh, or God, is speaking to the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord. Now let me ask you a question. Where is Jesus physically at this moment? 
Yes, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. The, the spirit of Christ dwells among us. Where is Jesus physically in this moment? Well, here's the clue. Stephen tells us. In Acts chapter 7, verse 57, Stephen says, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ, alive forevermore in this moment, is at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he lives, ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Now notice here what David says. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, Oh, I love this. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Before sitting and taking his seat at the right hand, he had to first make purification for sins. So at the right hand of the Father, of Yahweh, resides the Messiah, the exalted Messiah, the resurrected Messiah. And we know this too. Because it says, sit at my right hand, and then until I put your enemies under your feet. What is this line? I submit to you that the Apostle Paul had this line on his mind, on his heart, when he's writing in 1 Corinthians 15 about resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, the 1525, the Apostle Paul, this Psalm of David on his heart, says, for he, speaking of Christ, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Do you see a parallel that's happening here? Do you see these connections? Because this Psalm of David is written B.C. 1000. What is David doing here? David is preaching the gospel David is looking forward with the eye of faith to the humiliation and exaltation of the Messiah. You see what Jesus is doing here by using Psalm 110. He is arguing for his divinity based upon divine revelation. But also Christ knows, Jesus Christ knows in this moment that the glorification of the Messiah comes after the cross. He must make purification for sins before physically sitting at the right hand of the Father in the incarnate state. The enemies then are put under his feet, but first comes resurrection. So if we were to understand the whole of Scripture, we take our biblical theology here, and we look at Psalm 110, and we bring this all together, What's being stated here in this one verse? The Father is promising to the Son exaltation and rule through death and resurrection. Some argue that the scriptures don't speak about a covenant of redemption. Psalm 110 does. Let's move on from there. Verse 37, David calls him my Adonai. David calls him the Messiah, Lord. So Jesus asks, so how is he his son? The point being made here is that David would never call his biological descendant Lord or Master. That is culturally inappropriate. And so what Jesus draws out for in his conclusion that he makes here is that the Messiah, the Christ, is one who is greater than David. We know this, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus the Christ is the son of David by natural generation. Now time does not permit, but if you were to go to Matthew chapter 1, and you can from verses 2 to 16, you can see that genealogical line that Matthew traces. But in Matthew chapter 1, 1, he does tell us that he, speaking of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is the son of David. That's one of the reasons why he's writing. Now, for Mark's purposes in writing, in Mark 1, 1, he opens up his gospel and says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God. So we understand this. Jesus the Christ is the Son of David, the Son of God. Who has made purification for sins and now reigns and rules at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Jesus, unpack, in, in giving this verse, I want you to notice how the crowd responds to him. In verse 37, and the great throng or the great crowd of people heard him gladly. Not so much the scribes. Because again, I submit to you, he was the Messiah that no one wanted. Let's bring this to bear upon us. The dangerous doctrine, the dangerous beliefs exposed there was that these men preached a half Christ. Beware of those who preach and teach, pastors and preachers, who preach a half Jesus. You know better than listening to a scribe, but what about pastors and preachers that use your same vocabulary? We must be discerning. Beware of those who emphasize one aspect of Jesus' nature at the expense of the other. Fully God, fully man. Not 50% God and 50% man. Not, not that he did everything in, the, in just the, simply as, as a man. Beware of those who will downplay the divinity to uphold the humanity and vice versa. We understand that the hypostatic union of all of God infused in all of man is a great mystery. The great miracle is that the fullness of God dwelt in him bodily. I can only imagine how all of God can be, I can't imagine how all of God can be contained in one person. I just, I just see a body exploding. Yet it happened. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Beware of preachers and pastors who know the scriptures but not Jesus. These scribes know the scriptures, they don't know Christ. Beware of preachers and pastors who point you to ideas and propositions, but not to the text of God's word. Beware of those who play fast and loose with the scriptures and deny divine inspiration. Run from them. Beware of preachers and pastors who do not rest upon the authority of the scriptures. Beware of preachers and pastors who downplay theology and doctrine for the sake of unity and experience. Beware of those who claim that Jesus became the Son of God at his baptism and was never eternally the Son of God. That teaching goes on. Beware of pastors and preachers who believe that the Jesus of the Bible and the Christ of history are two different people. The church has been at war with these doctrines, these men, and these heresies ever since the first century. And if we are not mindful of them, they will creep their ugly head back up and they will divide and pollute the church of Jesus Christ. Every doctrine and every heresy and every error is just a repackaging of the old. If you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Conversely, trust in the one who will faithfully reason from the scriptures. Trust the one whose roots run deep, who affirms the creeds. Not in a magisterial sense, but in a managerial sense. Trust the one who seeks to bring you and to behold the exalted Christ, the Jesus of scriptures, the Jesus of our faith, the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. This is the Jesus Christ that we worship. This is the Jesus Christ that we know. This is the Jesus Christ that came and gave his life to save sinners. This is the Jesus Christ that is exalted at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
Beware of pastors and preachers who teach a half-truth. Jesus exposes this dangerous doctrine because it leads to death. Beware of those who teach and preach a message of suffering and no triumph. Beware of those that also, in the same sense, on the exact opposite, have a theology of glory but no cross. Both are incomplete. Beware of them. Now Jesus moves here after affirming inspiration, proving the divinity of the Messiah. He moves to expose dangerous behavior. Verses 38 through 40. His teaching continues, and in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes. Beware of the scribes. Jesus will give three alarming attitudes, and he describes them by two behaviors each. Track this with me. In verse 38, the first alarming attitude is a desire for recognition. He's saying, beware of those who have a desire for recognition. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. What's the problem here? He's saying, watch out for those that like to dress for recognition. They want to be applauded. They want to be esteemed in public. They want others to look at them and say, oh, wow, there's that guy. Oh, there's Pastor so-and-so. Look at him. Beware of men who dress in a certain way to simply draw attention to themselves. Brothers and sisters, beware of pastors and preachers who have an over overemphasize a desire to be recognized. Beware of those that are motivated by the applause and the esteem of others. Those who feast on being seen and being popular, that need to have big, gigantic platforms to feel good about themselves. Those who find their identity in being recognized. That's what the scribes did. If you didn't recognize that they were a scribe, they would have gone home sad. (laughs) Because the day that that recognition stops, those that have a desire for this, they lose a sense of who they are. And they become lost. You see that in verse 38? Here's the second warning to beware of in the attitude. Beware of those that have a sense of of entitlement. Verse 39, he says, and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. What, would ha- what is he describing here? What would happen in the synagogue? There'd be a bench but, uh, along the front, and on this bench in the center would be the scripture reader, it'd be where the scrolls are, and along the bench, the scribes would go up and they'd sit on the, either the left side or the, the right side of the scripture reader or of the guy who was going to do the praying, and they wanted the front row seat. Now, what was interesting is that along the bench, the bench faced outward. So the scribes would be sitting all at the front, looking out and above the congregation. And they felt entitled that this is their spot. This is their place of prominence. And the people would look back at them and say, wow, that person's really something. They would not sit among the people. They would sit somewhat above the people. Places of honor at feasts. Beware of those that always have to sit at the head table. Never among the common folk. The attitude, of the, the attitude is, well, I'm a scribe. This is what I should get. Well, I'm a pastor. I should be entitled to this. I should get a front row seat. I should get this kind of treatment. I think you know where I'm going with this. Beware of pastors and preachers who act and think that they're your superior. Who desire prominence. Who have a sense of entitlement who desire treatment as though they are something. You know, I am so thankful for the people that God places in our lives to keep us humble and grounded. 
You should be thankful for the people in your life that God keep, that has placed in your life to keep you humble and grounded. You might not always like them, but be thankful for them because they are a blessing from God to you for your sanctification. For me, it's Kate. <laughs> and I always like her, always. And while she is undoubtedly my biggest supporter, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today without her. She is always one that shoots straight with me. All the time. (laughs) And I've shared this with you probably many times, but one of her favorite verses is Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Especially when it's directed towards me. I could give it to you or you could look it up. I'll give it to you. Yeah, the suspense was trying to build. Galatians 6, 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And it goes something like this in the soul home. Just remember, don't think you're something because you're nothing. Now go preach. (laughs) Thank you. But it's one of those things, just a reminder, Take heed lest you fall. Brothers and sisters, understand this. Wherever your area of service in Christian ministry is, all that we are, all that we have, and all that we will ever be is a gift from God. And it is a gift from God not for your glory but His and the good of others and His church. We should not have a sense of entitlement. We are sinners saved by grace. Oh, but by the grace of God, there go I. Third attitude and issue we see here that Jesus gives in two behaviors is a bent towards greed and false piety. He goes and says in verse 40, Speaking of these scribes who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. With the scribes, they would not receive a regular, uh, a regular wage. So they would either have to resort to or, or, or uh, rely upon tent making, their own maybe uh, secular work. Or they would rely upon the generosity and the gifts of others to support them in their ministry in their in the work that they did. And so what would often happen is scribes being uh, experts in the law, they would find vulnerable, the vulnerable and the weak. They would come alongside a widow and they'd say, yeah, I can help you with your estate. Not a problem. Widows are vulnerable. They had no husbands in the home and the ones in whom they are supposed to be trusting are the ones that are exploiting them. Many times they are coerced into gifting their homes. It would go something like, well, in the name of God, you can give. You could give your home to me. That would help to support the continuation of this, of my ministry. They would pry upon the vulnerable and the weak. This happens all the time today. And it's sickening. Beware of pastors and preachers who in the name of God seek to take advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. They are supposed to be shepherds who protect. Instead, they are wolves that exploit. They are dangerous. If you ever hear the line, sow a seed, reap a harvest, all your red flags need to go up. Simple application, never give money to the man on TV. Please do not buy the holy water on the infomercials. Spoiler alert, it's not real, okay? Our world is full of smooth talkers and charlatans who use the vocabulary of Christianity to satisfy their greedy ends. This is what the scribes were doing. They were using the vocabulary. They were resting upon, oh, we know the law of Moses. Now give me your home.
Listen, if you are uncertain about someone or something, you need to go to the person you trust. Go to that person who's proven trustworthy to you. Don't be taken advantage of. Seek to have discernment. But let's ask the question here. How does devouring widows' houses and long prayers go together? It's the same attitude here. This is the same thing Jesus is describing here in these two behaviors. And I would submit to you, it is a false piety is what's happening here. To cover up their greed, what do they do? They seek to demonstrate a higher level of spirituality, a form of super spirituality. And what's happening here is it's all a gimmick. It's all a show. Brothers and sisters, anybody can learn the words. I have known many who would make really long prayers who have made shipwreck of the faith. Beware of pastors and preachers who try to cover up dangerous behavior with false piety. If I pray for a long time, maybe I'm extra spiritual. They use well-polished prayer to throw people off the scent. And what does Jesus say about these men? They are dangerous. They have existed for 21 centuries. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. So before we start a witch hunt right now and put every pastor and preacher on notice, let's ask ourselves a couple questions. But I am inviting you to examine my life. Absolutely. But let's ask a couple questions. When we think about pastors and preachers, maybe some that are, we listen to and we hear. Does this man bring me to Jesus or does he bring me to his pet doctrines? Will he fearlessly stand up for truth even if it costs him? Maybe another question we should ask concerning pastors and preachers. Whose kingdom is he working for? His or Christ's? Does recognition drive him? Does he have a sense of entitlement? Is there a bent towards greed? Or is he generous? Is he hospitable? Beware of those who lead you to themselves and not Jesus. And as we would even close on this passage, let me give you some advice, especially anyone who is serving in Christian ministry, which should be every Christian. Your readiness in your service of Christian ministry, your readiness comes when the supreme object of your affection is Jesus Christ. When your central message is Christ and Him crucified, when your all-encompassing desire is Christ magnified and your primary motivation for anything that you do is Christ glorified. Friends, lose yourself in Jesus. And so when that happens, we stop thinking about ourselves and our own. and We begin to think more of him and his because the head of the church is Jesus Christ. And we are all parts made up for the good of others, for the glory of God. So we ask the question, what is the outcome of these dangerous beliefs and these dangerous behaviors? And as I opened this message, I told you this was a warning passage. And Jesus ends with a sobering warning. They will receive the greater condemnation. We should read that soberly. We should read that with heavy hearts. Because the damnation of souls will occur. There is a stricter judgment for those who use religion for their selfish gain. Friends, you might see the wicked prosper. You might see wicked men 
that masquerade as ministers and preachers and pastors. They might, you might see wicked people prosper by exploiting people through the use of Christianity. They fly in million-dollar jets. They pack out stadiums in Texas. They're always having the best-selling book at Barnes & Noble. They give you a half gospel. Recognize this, judgment is coming. And ultimately, the Lord will vindicate the faithful, and he will judge the wicked. Beware of pastors and preachers who love themselves more than Jesus. This is the warning passage before us. And as you think about this, also give thanks for the faithful ministers that have influenced your life, for the ones that care not about their own, but about the exaltation of Jesus, that would gladly lay their lives down upon the altar for your good, for your sanctification, for the glory of Christ in all things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that we would take this sobering passage to heart. We would be mindful of your commands. We'd be mindful of who we look towards, who we lean upon, who we trust. Father, we pray that for all of us, the centrality of our ministry, of our heart's desire, is the glory of Jesus in all things. That we would say with the psalmist, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.